All right, let's uh, let's get started. Let's look at uh, clean architecture. I think we'll we'll start with. Um, let me finish my tweet I was going to send. That's not it. Must be on that tab. There we go. Let me put Chatty somewhere. Hey, Shady Nagy, how's it going? Uh, trying to put YouTube somewhere, but I can't find it. It's right there. It's like one pixel. Or, sorry, I said YouTube. Winamp. I'm trying to find Winamp. When it's launching, it's launching as one pixel. I can't move it. How do I get to move it? Control, right click. Shift, shift, right click, move. There we go. Haha! -ha. I found Winamp. Alright, I have not streamed since I redid my monitor setup. So now my monitor is up here, and I've got another big wide monitor down here, so you're going to see a lot of me looking up today. Alright, let's go find. That wasn't what I wanted. Now where'd you go? It's back over there. That's weird. Move. Sync. There we go. Alright, play. Alright, we got music. Uh, Carl Franklin. Now it's gone again. What is up with that? I really wants to put that somewhere else. That's alright. It's playing. So we'll, we'll take it. Okay. Rune Sun, welcome. So, my goal for today's session is to just make some progress on some uh, open source stuff that I've fallen behind on. Um, and I thought I'd start with clean architecture because why not? Uh, we would like to get this. Uh, going for .NET 5, which is going to be out just around the corner, probably next month. Um, <clears throat> so let's let's see what we can do here. So this one, I think you might just have to close uh, this pull request, because it's from November 2019, and I think I asked, didn't ask, has merge conflicts. All right, well, I will ask. Uh... Can you update this? And I'll try to merge it. I feel bad about not having looked at it in a year, but that happens sometimes. Alright, we'll see what happens with that. Um, let's go over here. We're going to add some logging support. We're going to organize things by use cases. I'm not going to bore you all with writing documentation uh, on the stream. And then this template support for Visual Studio on a Mac, that was something I would like someone else to help with if they can. Simply because I don't typically use a Mac these days. I have one. It's sitting on the floor over there, uh, but I haven't used it in a couple years. Alright, so... There's files. Alright, alright. So maybe we should just add application logging support to the template. There's that, and there's also just updating it to .NET 5. So I think... I think I have a branch for .NET 5 already. Um, it's RC1. What are we on for .NET 5? Did Release Candidate 2 ever ship? There's one it. I think that's it. So unless Release Candidate 2 comes out sometime real soon, I think we're still good there. So I want to work on the .NET 5 one, uh, and we can add logging to it perhaps. And then uh, when we merge that in, when, when .NET 5 ships, then we'll have that feature as well. So let's do that. All right. So I've already got it running over here. And if we look at startup and see what do we have, let's just make sure that we can build and we get all the tests. And we're already on .NET 5. It's an update. Should we do the update? I usually try and do the updates before the stream, but this one just popped up. Let's see. It's already downloaded. 
shouldn't take too long. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna look at this thing with uh, without Visual Studio real quick while that goes on. So here's my source control. Just pop it up in PowerShell. PowerShell. There we go. And we're on .NET 5. Let's do a git pull. Let's do a .NET build. Any of you go to my Zoom conference talk I just did this morning for uh, Romania? Mexico Innovative Tech Talks. I was talking for like an hour and a half straight, so I still need to rehydrate. All right. Um, what? Visual Studio Installer is telling me that I have to restart, which I'm not going to do. All right, but that worked, and so that means we can do that, but that won't probably open it up in preview. So let me just force it to be preview. Really? Setup requires... Oh, man. All right. Well, maybe I shouldn't have done that update. Visual Studio is usually so good about that. Okay, fine. We're doing code. VS Code today. Okay. So, we ran it. Uh, let's make sure the tests work. So we're going to do a terminal. Uh, PowerShell's fine. And we're going to do .NET uh, watch test. Let's see if that works. Hmm, really? Dash dash project. All right. No. Uh, that. Nope. Really, doesn't a test doesn't work on a solution or a watch test? Then a test works. I thought this would work. Code stencil. How's it going? Using .NET Watch for continuous testing. .NET Watch. Detect that I'm in a solution folder. Um, yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? We don't plan to do this. Okay, thanks Microsoft. We agree it's reasonable though. <laughs> Alright. Uh, hmm. Fine. I would really like to run my tests uh, all the time. I have a test runner over here. Maybe I just run those. Is there a way to do these constantly? Not really. Alright. Let's just use that. Okay, so we want to add some logging uh, by default. And I think probably Serilog is the way to go. So let's, uh, let's look up some Serilog here. So... Seems to be the, the standard these days. Uh, and it does some nice formatted, structured logging. Uh, and we're going to just add that. But I also like to have these things run. Oh, there they go. Looks like they're, things are hiding. Where'd all my other tests go? I don't use this test runner very much. Um, I thought I had more tests than this. Where'd they go? Hmm. Fan Ouska bro. Fanasek? Fanasek bro? What's up? Not sure how to read your name, sorry. Alright, so now they're all there, but, um,. If I run them all, why did they disappear, some of them? <coughs> all right, well, that's testing again. Maybe it only shows me failures? What is this thing doing? Like, okay, here's here's two of your tests. I get rid of all the rest of them for you. Yeah, that's not really what I wanted. All right. 
The test passed though, that's the important thing. So let's go look at program, program. Yeah, let's do program, program CS. Let's look at that for logging. We got a logger right there. Uh, logger, I logger, okay. Configured logging here is adding console to the built-in logger, but we're not using Serilog. So if we want to add Serilog, we should go look at how to add Serilog. So adding Serilog to there. TLDR, right, okay. Blah, 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 getting started. Add the package. All right, let's do that. In fact, since we're using VS Code anyway in the console, let's just do it with this, which is not usually how I do it in Visual Studio, but we're not in Visual Studio, because so, it wants a reboot. Um, so in here, we're gonna get a source, and I have my web camera set up between my monitors, and it covers up the very bottom line of this window, so I can't quite see what that says. Uh, we wanna go CD web, and that's where we want to add this line. All right, so if we look at what it just did, we'll see that it's here, and it's right there, Serilog. All right, so what's next? Um, now we want to initialize it in program.cs. So in program.cs, it normally looks like that, and we want to do this stuff. Um, so let's just put this side by side. We'll throw this over here, We'll throw this over here, and we'll close this down, and we'll go back to program.cs. Um, and we'll start by using Serilog, sure. Hopefully that'll work. Unknown. Well... That worked. What do you say now? Anything? I don't know. It should work. And it built, so I don't know why this is not working. What are you trying to tell me? Yeah, that's not what I want. Okay. Um, Alright, so inside here, the updated main method says we're going to get a new logger configuration, which I don't have yet. And that's just the first thing you're doing. All right, well, let's try that. I'm okay to tightly couple to you right here for now. So the very first thing we're gonna do is just get a logger. And then we're gonna try starting up uh, and otherwise crash out. And we're gonna put the create host builder itself inside of this. Now I want to add this other stuff, but I can do that after this try catch, I think. So let's let's give this a shot. Let's wrap this whole thing and do it right here, but they're adding the dot run call also. So do I need a nested try catch? And what about this logger down here? Um, let's try just building it first. So we'll do this. And we're gonna not run it. So we'll just build it like I was doing before. And it's not really going to be exactly the same, but give it a shot. All right. This isn't really starting up, though, it's just building. So do I need the run? I guess I need this whole thing. And then the run. Let's just do that. So there's my build. And there's that. And I need this host. Uh, where'd my host go? Should be right there, right? All right, that looks fine. That'll build, we hope. Serilog configuration is self-explanatory. Enrich from log context, okay. 
Now plug into ASP.NET Core and say use Serilog. All right, so down here I have a logging thing. If configure logging. Um, I create host builder. Create host builder. Defaults. Create default builder R. So you want to do use Serilog very first thing. I can do that. Dot, dot, use Serilog. All right. And then start up. Okay, so then I probably don't need this anymore. Um, so let's ditch that just to see what happens. Just comment it for now. Uh, WebBuilder.use startup. Now we'll just be that. Right? That looks good. Code stencil. How long will it take you to build this CA template from working source code? I want to compare the time with how long it will take for a code stencil to build a stencil similar to templates. What is a CA template? Oh, clean architecture template. How long it will take you to build this clean architecture template from a working... Are you talking about build like compile? Or I'm not sure what you're asking. How long did it take me to build this whole sample? Because that took some time. Um, and I've been maintaining it for like four years now. So... I don't know, it's been a bit of time over that time. Creating a new template. Um, I did create a new clean architecture for worker services template. Is that what you mean? That one didn't take too long. Like I just took this one and changed out the front end. Tony, uh, we're just doing some open source coding. I'm adding Serilog to my clean architecture template for .NET 5 is the uh, the idea. Alright, so let's try and run this. I can't remember if I built it already. I think I did. It builds. Alright, so let's run it. And look at that. We got some nice... Uh, this logging is already better than it was. Um, I probably should have used Serilog a long time ago. Because this is all colorful and pretty. Um, let's see what that looks like by contrast, actually. So let me, let me kill this. Forget about the actual app running. And we'll say we're not going to use Serilog, um, but instead we're going to do what we did before here. And let's done it run that. And I don't think it was nearly as pretty. Right, yeah, so here's the default, you know, logging from ASP.NET Core. It has info for these things, and it, it's showing you mostly the same data, I suspect. Um, but it's not colored, except for the, the info here. So... I don't know. I think that's a little nicer. Back to that. Do that. Break that. Run that. Alright, so then over here, like having, having our strings uh, broken out like this, that's a lot easier to read and see. And I can see it's coming from EF SQLite. And the URLs are all blue. That's a lot easier to find. We can run this. There's our app. All right, so overall, I'm pretty happy with this out of the gate. Having the times stand out as purple here, that's pretty nice. Fail to determine HTTPS port for redirect, that's that's fine. Yeah, for for some reason I'm not using HTTPS, but I probably ought to be. Um, wonder if I can configure that while we're here. All right, creating a new template, 30 minutes to an hour, code stencil. Um, It'll probably take me about an hour to make a new template for clean architecture to target a different front end. So right now, if we look at the code here, this web front end is obviously ASP.NET Core. Um, I have another one that I did, and I think it probably took me about an hour the first time. So if we go to github.com, Wacker Dallas, and we search for clean architecture over yonder, There's a clean architecture worker service one here, which incidentally probably needs updated to .NET 5 as well. Um, but the only difference, if we look here, you're not gonna work, are you? All right, fine. The only difference, if we look, now you're just all messed up. There we go. Here, stop it. 
This thing's been bugging me today. It doesn't doesn't want to work. Uh, maybe I need to log into GitHub. I don't know. Maybe that'll help. All right. The only difference is this worker project, right? Everything else, the core, the infrastructure, the unit tests, all that stuff was pretty much the same project. Um, and just building this worker project, probably in wiring it all together here, probably took an hour. It wasn't bad. All right. Um, so there's that. There's logging. What else can I do with Serilog? Uh, let's go. Let's see. So, ASP.NET yes, uh, Web Builder. I'm doing that. That's right. Okay. Here's what it looks like. Yep. That's what mine looks like. Cleaning up the remnants of the default logger. There are a few spots that traces of the default logger remain. Right. So we got to clean that up. This can be removed. Logging. Okay. Let's do that. So over here in app settings, there's this logging section. No longer. Bam. All right. What else we got? After cleaning that up, community looks like, yep, okay. You need to do the Serilog is covered with Serilog settings configuration. Writing your own log events. In program CS, we use log class directly. This works well. Yeah, where did that starting up thing end up anyway? It was just right here info, starting up. Okay. Alternately, you can consume the iLog RFT interface from the framework via DI. Serilog implements this interface so the results are identical. Right? So this is the ASP.NET Core framework iLog RFT, which I'd really rather wrap uh, personally. But let's see how many logger instances I have in here anyway. I don't think I have a whole lot. All right, so I have an iLogger of email sender here for when we want to send email. Does anything actually send email? I don't think it does. And this iLogger is a Microsoft iLogger. Okay. So that should work with Serilog. Um, so I can just try and test that out. Tony missed the presentation this morning. They uh, theoretically recorded it. Like I saw that it was recorded in Zoom. So they were going to post it on YouTube somewhere. So it was Innovative Tech Talks. Um, Max code, uh, innovative tech talks, something like that, um, here. And so somewhere, somewhere they're going to post them. Um, there's my thing right there, but I don't know where. So probably it'll be on a YouTube, I'm guessing. But if you keep an eye on this, you'll probably find it. All right. All right. So, um, my controllers don't have loggers. Maybe they should. And I'd like it if I could send an email from something just as a as a test, even if I don't end up committing that. So let's let's go find some places to test logging some more. Um, my controller, my home controller. Why not? Let's add a logger to it. Um, Constructor takes some parameters like an iLogger of home controller logger logger. I like the underscore prefix. Uh, you're not going to let me rename it though, are you? I don't need the this. So I know it's it's on this. All right, and then you're going to say that. Uh, that's not what I want to say, but we'll say logger.log Huh. I don't have whatever uh, namespace I need for the extension method. It's using Microsoft.extensions, SMIC core extensions logging I want to say uh, all right that looks right so instead of high we're gonna say um, I 
And then this, I think, supports structured logging like this. We'll see what that does. All right. I haven't used Sarah log in a little while. Um, so here we'll try and run it again. And it doesn't like something. Um, type namespace extension. Oh, I did, didn't get it right. All right. Logging. Uh, not logger. Logging. Let's see if that works. Nope. Microsoft extension slime. Maybe it's not ASP.NET Core. It's just that? It's one of these. There we go. Alright. Now, if we hit the home page. Home. Uh, we get called get on nothing. Alright. Now, this is really useless logging because it's already going to tell me here that it was running the view index and that it took so long. Um, so this is not something I really need, uh, but I'm just trying to play around with it. So what else can we do here? For one thing, this name of really should have worked better. Uh, I was expecting Saralog to pick this up as a parameter and do something with it. Um, I know I could have done this, dollar sign, and then here, name of index, right, and that should be fine. But if you separate values with a comma, it's supposed to do something with the structured logs. So let's try this again. Index. So that worked. Okay. Well, let's keep reading. So recording structured logs. Mm -hmm. Structured logs can be captured as easily specifying a formatter. Oh, isn't that nice? We're adding a file sync. Uh, let's just do a formatter. So let's go to program.cs. Right to back in. Is that way up here? Right to console. There we go. New rendered compact. Okay. These options suit many environments. You can use seek, which I don't need to use right now. Looks like a lot of this is going to be seek, but that's because the author works it for seek. Um, all right, let's just see what this does. So let's close this down and run it again. Um, I didn't like that. Rendered compact JSON formatter. Where are you? I don't know. Visual Studio would probably help me a little better. Is it a seek thing? I really didn't think it was seek related. Compact JSON for rendered compact JSON format. Serialog formatting compact. Do I need that? Uh, probably. It's got four million downloads. Um, buy. Bloomheart. Called get on action name of index. You like that better, Kabazi? What would action be? Um, <coughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Um, okay. Called get on action. No, I don't see what you're saying. The action name is index. Anyway, I think I need this. Um, I'm not seeing that it's dependent on, or that Saralog is dependent on it. So let's just copy this and paste it here to add it. Uh, 
Hmm. Did that work? I probably need to add a namespace. See if that's the one. Hey, look at that. Okay, so that's not at all what I expected to see though. Because now it really is just formatting everything out as JSON. Executed command. Here's some JSON. Great, thanks. Um, I think I liked it better before. So, in that case, uh, let's not use that. Let's use... Hmm. What are my options? That just made it worse. Yeah, I don't think I know enough about how people want to do things to specify custom formatting for their output. So I think I'm just going to leave it the way it was. We'll get rid of the uh, extra dependency. We'll go back to what we had a minute ago. So we'll go back here. And the formatting uh, compact, we'll get rid of. And let's try this one more time. I don't know why Octotree is misbehaving. Alright, I like that. That's good enough. Let's call that done. Um, so we're going to just make this uh, added Sarah log logging um, to template. How about that? Good enough. And we're going to push this. How do you pick the meetings, conferences that you want to speak at? Um, lately, I've been so busy, I haven't been reaching out to them. They've reached out to me. So in this case, they, they reached out to me and invited me. And I was like, all right, who else is speaking? And they they said, here's who we've got. And I was like, yeah, OK, that sounds like good people. I'll, I'll give that a shot. Um, so theoretically, in a normal year, you know, there would be other considerations like, where is it? And how busy am I? And are they paying for travel or things like that? Um, so the max code people I've never worked with before, um, <clears throat> but they have a uh, they're in I think Romania I want to say. Um, like I really ought to know this because I literally was just speaking there, but uh, uh, they are in. All their stuff says the Netherlands, but they're not in the Netherlands. I'm pretty sure they're in Romania. And it would be cool, like I've been to Bulgaria a few times to speak for a DevReach conference, and it was great. Like, it's beautiful. Uh, my wife and I went a few times. Um, there we go, Romania. Yeah, so so I would love to go to Romania sometime. I've never been to Romania. Um, but uh, with virtual conferences, it's not quite the same. So, you know, I was here. Uh, and it, it was it was pretty amazing that I could teleport to Romania and give a talk uh, an hour ago, and now I'm back here uh, streaming from my basement once again. Um, but that's the uh, the magic of the internet. So under normal times, I would I would ask where is it and, and things like that. Conferences are really different when they're all virtual, right? Like you don't get that interaction, you don't get feedback from users as you're speaking, you don't get. Uh, the chance to network with speakers that you're buddies with. Like there were there were four other speakers on these tech talks this week. I haven't talked to any of them. Didn't see them. They gave their talks remotely. I gave my talk remotely. We were never together. 
Um, whereas with a real conference, you know, if, if I see who's going and it's like, oh yeah, you know, Richard and Carl from .NET Rocks are going to be there. I love hanging out with them. You know, I'll, I'll, that adds to my appeal. That adds to why I'd want to go. Um, and then why, why would anyone speak at a conference, right? Like what's the, what's in it for you? Well, I mean, you've got, you know, ego, like, Hey, you could speak at a conference. That's pretty cool. Right. Um, you've got marketing, um, if you're independent or you have your own product or company, like like I have my coaching, mentoring services, uh, I have plural site courses I want to promote. Um, there's marketing benefits, so giving giving talks has marketing benefits because I'm reaching people that maybe have never heard of me before and and they want to um, go watch my plural site course or they want to hire me to come train their team. So at that point, it's a question of well, how big is it? How much benefit marketing wise is there? Well, here's this conference we've never done before, and you're our, you know, first speaker that we're thinking of, and, you know, maybe we're going to get 10 people. Well, is it worth my time to do a talk for 10 people? I don't know. Is it going to be recorded? Maybe it'll get more people later. Um, but if it's a big, well-known conference, and I know they're going to get hundreds or thousands of people, then, yeah, that's a lot more appealing um, from a marketing standpoint. Uh, and some conferences will actually pay you. Like, you know, some conferences pay you... Uh, just travel, right? Some conferences will pay you something for speaking. Um, it's pretty rare, but but it does happen. Uh, mostly in-person uh, conferences that have a, a fairly expensive attendee cost, like, you know, if you're paying 2000 or 2500 per attendee to come to this event, um, it's more likely that speakers are going to get some kind of compensation. If it's a community event where, you know, the speaker or the, uh, the attendee cost is maybe 100 bucks or, you know, couple hundred bucks um then probably the speakers aren't getting paid right and, and maybe they're not even getting travel uh, but it's a different style of event right nobody's trying to make money off of it so it's it's all it's all fine so i don't know i hope that helps um that's kind of what goes into my thinking uh and then i have a bunch of things i like to talk about so if it's if it's a talk that I've given before and I'd like to talk about, then I'm more likely to want to do it. If a conference comes to me and they're like, hey, we really want you to do this thing on this topic, and I'm like, well, I don't have anything prepared, um, and I've never given that talk before, then, you know, it's a harder sell, right? Because I'd have to do more work to, to get that together and be able to do it. Um, but sometimes that's how I decide I want to learn something. Like, you know, I'm, I'm going to commit to doing a talk on this new topic I've never done before at your conference in six months. Now I need to really get my stuff together and learn that so I can be ready. John Calloway wants to know if I would talk at his meetup in December. Well, how many people are going to be there, John? What do you think? I'm probably free. Um, time zones are another consideration, right? So uh, if you're in the U.S., I can probably make your time zone pretty easily. But if you're in Australia or you know Asia or something and you know somebody wants me to speak at their conference... Either they're going to be at an inconvenient time, or I'm going to be at an inconvenient time, and that can be an issue too. <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of uh, things. Tony Davis says, additionally, practices like event storming are very impacted by virtual, and that's definitely true. Um, it's it's hard. Uh, so, it's it's not as good as in person uh, in many ways. It has benefits, like there's no jet lag, there's no travel time, there's no. Uh, getting the uh the coronavirus from being on a plane with a bunch of sick people um so there's all that but uh but yeah i miss in-person events definitely uh john calloway yeah i'm probably fine to do a talk at your meetup you know hit me up um tell me a date tell me uh details and and we can make that happen all right so um I just need the pull request this thing. No, I don't even need to. I just committed it right to the branch. So if you were to grab the .NET 5 branch, you would have logging now. And that means that I can go over here and I can say, hey, add this. Uh, and it was fixed. I don't, even, I don't even have a PR for it. So fixed in, fixed via Serilog support added to .NET 5 branch. Close. All right, what else we got? Um, what are we doing on time? We're all right. I think I'm done here. So let's let's go check out my other repos because I have not had a chance to keep up with things much the last few months. I've been really behind trying to get Pluralsight courses done. So um, how many people we got in here? Anyway, where's my Twitch dashboard thingy? 
Does it even show me? Somewhere it shows me how many people are here. I don't know. All my stuff's all moved around. Uh, 16 viewers. Hmm. Alright. Cool. Glad to have you all. Uh, I don't think, uh, I suspect if you're here you know about my plural site courses. So I do have a new one on rules engine um, that you could check out if, you, if you're interested. Uh, but that's been why I haven't been streaming, is between that and a bunch of client deadlines, I've been really booked solid. So, uh, let's see what has accumulated in terms of issues and pull requests. So, let's try this pull request first. I'm going to uninstall this uh, Octotree thing, despite my love for it, because it keeps us bouncing around here. Um, if I log in, does that help? Maybe? Sure. DGD question in Regex Live. Okay. Uh, okay, logged into Octotree. Maybe that'll help it stop bouncing. Pull request. Modify to include parameter name. Why is there an X on this? Test failure. Uh, this is from a while ago, right? You're still bouncing. Stop it. August 27th, suggested fix. Did you just not add a test or not fix a test? Why is this out here? really hard to tell what happened here. Test run aborted, but you're not telling me that a test failed. One test file matched. Framework ASP.NET Core and a Core App 2 was not found. Need to install the appropriate framework. Alright, so did I change something about how I build these? Really, Octotree, I'm going to uninstall you. That's annoying. Uh, let's try the build one first. It's on 3.1. <coughs> um, that should all be fine. I think. Simon Gearing, how's it going, man? <laughs> um, Alright, that looks fine. Let me, let me just rerun this thing and see if that fixes it. Uh, let's go find this details and how do you rerun one of these? Ran last month. Yeah, run it now. Run it. Run it. There once was a way to rerun these these builds. I don't know what it is now. Alright. Dot core. There's no way to run a build in GitHub Actions. What's up with that? Am I blind? Somebody tell me if there's a way to rerun this build. Copy, ran, workflow file, run the build. Rerun the build. Hmm. See, if I can't rerun the build, I can't do anything with this thing except try and run it locally, right? I have to set it as a trigger. So, what is a trigger? Is there a trigger I specify for on demand? Tony, yeah, go ahead and ask the DDD question. That's cool. Well, I'll jump over there in a second. I would really like to be able to manually restart a workflow. That would be nice. Uh, so there's, you can add a commit, but I don't want to add a commit to his fork of my repo. Uh, it's not possible to restart that. In the upper right hand corner of the workflow, you can do this. No. No, you can't, because it's not there. 
Rerunning a workflow. Uh-huh. I clicked it. Go to actions. Over there. There's your thing. Now on the upper right, rerun all jobs. List of workflows. Okay, let's see. Pretty sure I would have seen that. Uh, over here. So go to actions. Go to my workflow. This one. This one. Not there. Go to all workflows. Still not there. Go to this one. Still not there. Um, pretty sure it's not there. Pretty sure GitHub lies. Uh, yeah, we tried all that. Okay, in the upper right corner needs an additional trigger in the YAML. Okay. Right, I believe you. Uh, Tony's going with regex. Mm. What YAML trigger is required to rerun GitHub action? Rinse the trigger workflows. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Okay, on a build failed from the docs, run the thing with rerun all checks. So if your run did not fail, you have to trigger something that your thing triggers on. Right? You can now use GitHub Actions API. Okay, I could do a post to this. That's interesting. Um, those are all not useful. I want to know every time a commit is pushed, right? Manual trigger with workflow dispatch. Okay. You might consider from July of 2020. Yeah, that's recent. Uh, do, do, do. On workflow dispatch, do these things. All right, so I need this. Is this what you're thinking of, John Kelloway? Manual events. I think that's the same thing we're talking about. Looks like it. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's try that. So I'll come over here. And we'll go to code. And we'll go GitHub. I don't know if this will show up in his branch, though. Because he doesn't have this build in his branch. And I can't commit to his branch. But uh, on... Workflow Dispatch, Branches, can I tell it to do his branch? Or can I tell it to do PRs? Um, hmm. Oh, that's interesting. If, if uh, you star or unstar the repo, you can do it on a watch. Okay, that's a good hack. You get a plus from me. I'm not sure if I'm going to do that, but okay. Uh, on issue or comment. Alright. <coughs> right. Okay, they're talking about a different thing, like manually deploying to production, which is not what I'm going for. Um... Yeah, you're still using Azure DevOps. Azure DevOps has got more features still. Uh, but but GitHub Actions is catching up fast. That's that's where things are coming from. So publish on workflow dispatch. Fills a multiple workflows. Under workflows, each with its own trigger. For instance, a workflow that builds and runs tests and every push and pull request and another that's triggered manually publish the artifact. Right, so you get that one, you get that one. I really maybe I just need a manual build. Um, but I still need to specify which branch it's going to do, I think. Which is unfortunate. Um, I guess just do branches master there again. Maybe it'll pick it up because it's in a, a PR to master. Um, well, we'll see. Let's go back to pull requests. Maybe I'll just merge it and then the thing will work. Up hey, there we go. Updating the branch will definitely get the build to go again. I should have thought of that. Yep. 
Yeah, Simon, that that new security on GitHub pipelines is a real pain, I will tell you. Especially if you're used to using HTTP for your GitHub cloning. It kind of forces you down the path of using SSH. iOS 14 picture in picture is really nice for watching this on mobile. Cool. What's the picture in picture? Are you seeing you're doing whatever you're doing and then you see my picture in picture is, is the is the stream? Like you're not seeing two things, two pictures from my stream, I assume. You know, this is why I was still using DevOps. Yes, that was a pain in the ass. <coughs> Um, all right, so let this build for a minute. Let's talk Regix Live. Uh, let me scroll up a little bit here. Where was your question, Tony? My question may or not be worth a discussion. I understand the Regix Live problem to me is not that complex, right? And here's my issue. Okay, let me take that tab and throw it up here. Discussion from a little while ago. All right. Uh, domain model for Regix Live. And Tony says we've got authors, we've got users, we've got expressions, we've got reactions, and your question is going to be how do we do aggregates with this? Um, previous thinking has been revised. Previous thinking was whether authors and expressions, how they owned one another. So the, the root of this question is going to be, where do we draw the lines for aggregates, right? Uh, one of the rules you can use for aggregates um, that's described here is that when you delete an aggregate root, it should delete everything under it. And so the question would be, if we deleted an author, would it delete all their expressions? And yeah, I mean, if, if they owned those expressions, if they uh, had a copyright on them, then yeah, it would probably delete all their expressions. And also if we deleted a user, would it delete all of the reactions that they had left on the site? Probably, or perhaps I would go through and, and you know, swap it out and say, like, you know, anonymous user123 uh, made all these reactions, just if I wanted to keep them. But they would no longer be associated with the user that was deleted. So, uh, like, like, the actual user. The, the entity might still be there, because I could just, you know, anonymize it. But that would be uh, a special case, I think. If we really were just deleting them, I think their reactions would have to go with them. Um, but what does that mean if I delete a reaction, or sorry, if I delete an expression that had reactions, what do you do then? Um, which I think is the ultimate question here. So deleting an author probably deletes expressions, yes. Uh, and that may be eventually consistent, maybe. You know, I could show anonymous if it's an author that no longer exists, sure. Um, right? Okay, so we're talking cascade deletes. And... How should I be thinking about this? I feel like I'm missing something. I'm not sure what. Um, so maybe the author is either a singleton aggregate or we have a user author aggregate. Maybe both author and user are just their own aggregates. Yeah, so I think this user and this author aren't necessarily the same, the same individual, right? Like an author is a user, but not all users are authors. And an author of expression one, two, three uh, might get some other user that's not that author leaving a reaction. So that's where this whole thing gets a little bit complicated. Um, which is nice, because it's actually a very simple domain, and yet, you know, this is a very common use case, so it's, it's an interesting one to think about. Um, Surly Dev, I just have a couple of phones knocking around and a tablet or two. So I to look at switching, okay. Uh, Simon, I love that someone took a photo of drawing with a pen and paper, yes. Surly Dev, talks about office lens, is pretty cool. All right, and Shady, if you're still here, um, also had a comment on this one. Is he still here? I think he left. No, there he is. Yep, Shady's still here. Uh, and says, I think the reader viewer will not be authenticated, and if we create the user, then there will be author only without any role. But if a user is created without the role of administrator, then uh, it had some more future, like delete or other things to control users. Would user be in a different bounded context, since both user and author are two different terms referring to the same concept? Right. Okay, so let's think about this in terms of use cases. So, so I'll type this out here. I like to think first in terms of use cases or scenarios. All right, so 
we have one uh, as an author I can add a new regular expression to my collection of regexes okay that's one um, as an author I can update my regular expressions and as an author let's just say we can delete them I can delete my regular expressions okay so that gives us our first set of things here on the left I have an author and I can manage a collection of things um, let's say as a user I can become an author uh, by well, I don't know, in, this, in the case of this thing, I mean, I think anyone could submit an expression. Um, and when you do so, I think that just makes you an author. Uh, so by creating my first regular expression. Um, so there would need to be some service or some other thing to bootstrap that, or, or maybe even just in a controller, it would say, oh, you're adding an expression and you're not already an author? Well, here, let me create an author uh, with your user ID and go from there. Okay, so those are all pretty simple. Now that's basically regular expressions uh, and, and how those types work together. And now we have feedback. All right, feedback is different. Feedback is as a user, and at the moment I don't, let's say we don't allow anonymous feedback. Um, I can add a rating or reaction to a regular expression. All right, that's one. As a user, I can remove uh, Etc. Etc. Right. Same thing. Let's do that. And as a user, I can update, which is basically a, a remove plus an add, uh, perhaps. Okay. As a sewer. That's how I think about users. Or sewers. Okay. Add a user. As a user. Um, okay. So, what happens if I delete a user? because uh, I haven't talked about that. That's like meta. That's like higher level. Um, and also, what happens now to this feedback for a regular expression here? So, questions. Uh, let's see, design questions. Um, first off, uh, does an does a reaction have a navigation property to an expression? Does it need one? Um, or just an ID? Uh, if it just has an ID, right, if we come look at this and you say there's this one to end thing, if this has actually got like an expression property on it that's a strongly typed thing, uh, then when this gets updated or, or deleted or vice versa, then these things have a relationship in our data model, in Entity Framework. Uh, and that will have consequences. It makes it certainly much more difficult to say that this is an aggregate uh, and this is an aggregate. So at that point, it's, it's probably better if this thing doesn't have a direct knowledge of this. Um, in fact, uh, do reactions even need to live in the same data model or bounded context as the thing to which they are reacting. All right, at the end of the day, all a reaction needs is a user ID to say who's reacting and some uh, resource ID that in this case is an expression, but it could really be anything um, that they're reacting to. Because I could build a reaction system uh, that uses these users and reacts to blog posts, forum posts, Stack Overflow answers, whatever it might be, in addition to or separately from regular expressions. Um, so at that point, like, does it make sense uh, to just say, you know, maybe, maybe feedback is a separate BC or microservice even? And what does that mean for our design? Well, obviously, if this thing is, is that separate, then you can't have consistency between the two systems, typically, uh, directly, right? You're going to have some kind of eventual consistency. And the feedback system uh, is going to be bounded from the, the expression system. 
Um, and we can achieve that without having an actual microservice and without having separate everything, right? We can have that same design all inside of one assembly or one solution. Um, okay, so what should happen to a reaction when its target, let's say, uh, is not there, is deleted, is deleted or missing? Right, you'll have these orphaned reactions. Is that a big deal? Do we care? Um, well, when would that ever matter, right? Like, when would this matter? Uh, it's it's orphan data, but it will never be shown anywhere. You know, clean it up on some batch process if you need to with a batch process periodically, and you know. Leave it alone. That that would be one approach to it. Um, okay. Now if I so I'm leaning as I as I talk through this. Like I didn't have a, a solution in mind when I started, but as I talk through this, I'm really thinking on the left, this is an aggregate, and author is the aggregate root, and it has a bunch of expressions. And on the right, this is feedback, and user is an aggregate root, and reactions are its collection of things, or even reaction is just a standalone aggregate root, right? Now, something should probably have a collection of reactions, um, and that's where I'm thinking user comes into play, but but user doesn't need to have any behavior, right, necessarily. It's just the user ID that I care about, um, and the fact that this user is the same as the one that author uses is, again, it's just coincidental. This user has some GUID or some email address. This author has some user associated with it that we can identify using some GUID or some email address. They don't have to have a compile time relationship with one another. This could be in a separate system. It could be uh, using OIDC, and I'm getting back you know, some user ID from GitHub that they authenticated with that tells me their username. Um, and I just store that on the author so I can, so I can link them together. But it's a, it's a runtime linkage, right? It's just a property. It's not a compile time uh, property that's between these two. Um, so another question here would be, you know, do user and author need to be tightly coupled at uh, compile time? And ideally, no, right? Like, can we just use an identifier like a user ID, GUID, or you know, email address, etc. Um, and so if we just you know, use email address, let's say, as our user identifier, then you know, at that point this design gets really simple, right? Reactions all have an email address associated with them. Authors have an email address associated with them. Um, this is an aggregate, and if you delete an author, its expressions go away. This is a standalone aggregate. Uh, it doesn't know anything about users or authors or expressions besides their key. Um, and so to create a reaction, I just need a resource ID, a, an email, uh, and then whatever that reaction needs to be. You know, maybe it's a one to five star rating, or maybe it's a thumbs up or a thumbs down. But whatever it is, I, those are the only three things I need. Um, and at that point, I don't think they're tightly coupled. So, you know, if we follow the approach here, which is, uh, let's say author is aggregate root, expression is child of author, user is not a navigation property of anything, user ID or surrogate key is used by author and rating. Then what we have is uh, no coupling between authors, users, ratings. We can delete authors uh, or expressions without impact to ratings, except maybe some orphaned records that we don't really care about. Um, and that's it. Uh, we could also delete uh, ratings just fine. Right? That was always true. So I don't know if that helps. Um, what do you think, Tony? Is that helpful? I'll throw this on the comments so we have some historical record. <coughs> 
Hey Neo Ashi. I put you all to sleep. Nothing? Alright, so that was our Regix log question. Uh, still awake. Alright. Coffee overdose. Nice. Tony's on his phone trying to figure out how to type a comment. Hey, late here. What are you working on? Hector. Um, just random open source stuff. Uh, questions. Trying to file, fix issues. Somebody gave me a thumbs up here. Sir, Shady Nagy. Thank you. Um, looking to fix issues and close PRs on some open source stuff. That's right. He can't get back from his pip. Yep. Um, Alright, so this thing failed again, so what the heck? Uh, still some issue with with building it? Let's see if I can run this thing locally. Guard clauses. Alright, let's, let's go find that. So, here's clean architecture, here's down here we have guard clauses. Let's just power shell into this. And we'll bring that up there, and we'll see if it's working on master at least. Uh, what do I have? Mm -hmm. What am I doing here? All right, where is it different? All the way up here? That? Is that it? I'm not seeing it. This one's underlined. I don't think, uh, whatever change I made, I'm not seeing it. Maybe it's white space somewhere. Undo changes. Discard. Yeah, whatever it is, it couldn't have been that important. Alright. Um, let's just, since we're in here now, let's just stay in here. And we'll pull down the latest. And let's see if we can build locally. Alright, build. Yep, case closed. Alright, good. Alright, guess what? We don't build locally either. Hmm. That's not ideal. Um, Tunnel Vision Labs. Reference Assembly Annotator. Where's all that junk? I wonder if I need a... Um, what is it called? Global JSON to tell it to use a different version. Because I'm using this version, which is maybe not going to work. Yep, you do. Yeah. So let's do that. Let's create a new file. Global JSON. I hate these things though, because then you got to get rid of them once the thing comes out of RC. Um, let's go over here, and maybe when I check this in, it'll fix this thing as well. Global.json 3.1 SDK. Need to do, to do. Show me an example. There we go. Uh, how about that? That looks good. Or even, even that would be good. Let's do that one. Alright, so back to here, paste that in, save it, and try now. Yay, it builds. Alright. Um, Netcore app 2 is out of support and will not receive security updates. Alright, that's good to know, I guess. Uh, let's just push this thing out there and see if that helps at all. So, um, add global.json for 3.1 SDK that push not only do you eventually have to get rid of them but you have to update them anytime vs patches and therefore patches dot anchor yeah it's annoying um yeah but having done that uh let's see our dallas regex slide we're done with that uh rerunning we figured out 
some things with that. Don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. Here we are. Uh, let's go back to this pull request. It should let me update it because I updated master. There we go. Update the branch. And now when it builds, hopefully it'll use the global JSON. I didn't update this thing to use .NET 5, though, so that shouldn't fix this. We'll see. Alright, um, this should be pretty quick, right? There we go. All right, we're on three one three oh one, which I think is close to the latest. And this guard clause's package is tiny, so it really shouldn't take too long. Uh, the stream having issues? You guys hear me? I'm still here. Hmm. My stream preview on Twitch dashboard isn't showing anything, which is uh, which is weird. It says I'm offline, but. Also shows my bitrate is 4,000 kilobits per second, so... Alright, test failed. Um, why? Net standard, net standard... Whatever this annotate thing is doing seems to be having issues. It's a lot of stuff. Seriously, what is the problem here? Test run aborted, test run for that one, build completed, start test execution, process A is not possible to find any compatible framework version, netcore app 2.0 was not found, the following frameworks were found. Alright, that seems like something I should be able to Google. And do I have to just update everything to three one? <coughs> Migration guide from two dot two to three dot zero says. Do this, do that, do the other. Make sure it's netcore app 3.0. Alright, let's check that out. So in here, I have a project. And maybe that needs to be 3.0. It's been working for a long time. Um, in here, I've got a project. And maybe that needs to be 3.0. Net standard? No, net standard should be fine. It should just be it should just be the test, right? So let's make sure this runs locally. Um, where's my new terminal? Terminal. Yeah. 
Mm, still here. You guys hear me fine. Isn't that version no longer supported? Yeah, apparently. It's been warning about that in the YAML logs for a while. Who looks at the YAML logs? Come on. Um, Alright, so... Did this work? Why am I in there? I'm in here. Alright, build failed. There's more than one package download of netcore app ref. See the annotate reference assembly version. Determinative nullability information. What is that? Um, netcore app through. Alright. Let me see. If I just go back to. Well, I can't do it with 5. Me, because YAML means my damn build keeps not working. Well, my build's been working up to this point. But now I do have to look at it. I agree. Target framework netcore app 3 is out of support. Okay. But you're not just telling me it's out of support. You're telling me it won't even build. There's more than one package download of that. What the heck is that? What are we doing today, they asked. We're fighting with GitHub Actions, just like every week. Um, yeah. There is more than one. I want to see my actual error. Oh, there's Tunnel Vision Labs. Whatever this is. Am I using this? I don't recall adding this to my project, but apparently I am. What are we going to do today, brain? Yeah. Alright. Um, remember, CICD is your friend and it'll save you time. That's what they told us. Tunnel Vision Labs. Why is this here? Directory build props. Uh, let's view history on this thing. Show file history. Over three months ago, someone added this. I don't know why this thing is helping us. At the moment it seems like it's not helping us. But before I rip it out, let's go see what it does. Anybody know what this thing does? Reference assembly annotator. You should really have a readme file or something. IL Weaver for adding nullability annotations. Okay, that sounds important. Um, Okay. So why aren't you working? What version do I have you on? Alpha 154. That should be fine. I have a global JSON on here now, right? We added that. So we're on 3 1 whatever. So this really ought to work now. Is that pinky in the brain, Simon? Alright, what comes after Netcore App 3.0? Clean, restore, rebuild. Yeah, that's what I'm trying. That's not working. Is it Netcore up 3.1 now? Um, that's all I wanted to know. Um, it's only this test project that's got issues. Which is weird, because this one really doesn't care about the nullability stuff. Um, 
Let's go on it. Crap three one. Is that a thing? Let's try it. Why do you keep switching me over to this output? It's not what I want. My global JSON's wrong, you're saying? I need to put SDK in something. That's a good call. So maybe it hasn't been working this whole time, even though I thought it was. Let's try that. Shading is on the ball. All right, now that build succeeded even before I did that, so that's something. Um, can I run my tests? No, because you don't actually have the SDK you said you had. You have 31402. Okay, let's do that. 402. Save. So now it's actually using global JSON. That's a good good sign. That works. 200 test pass. All right. But if I keep this thing and I use a version that's not the same version in my uh, GitHub action, I'm going to have problems. So I don't need that. So what, uh, what version am I installing here? Let's just go find out in here. I want to see the whole thing. That is really getting annoying. Three one three oh one. All right, but I've got locally four oh one. We said four oh two. All right, so let's do 402 on the server too, just for fun. So let's make that. Let me edit. What's going on here? I need to be on the main branch. That's my problem. Back to master. Now edit. Now 402. Okay, commit. Okay, so that's that. This is also on 402 global JSON. Yes, I'm able to build. I'm able to test. Um, let's commit all this. Fixed global. Global JSON set version. Check that. All right, I wanted to verify this. That's three one. That should work. So if I sync this, it should be good. So let's see. All right, back to watching GitHub Actions. Um, I gotta get latest on his pull request because this is the one I actually want to run. So update the branch, and we should be good. Okay, so under actions now. How long do these take normally? Two and a half minutes. Two and a half to three minutes. Sometimes only less than two minutes. Um, so let's just stare at the screen and hopefully it goes faster. And maybe .NET Core setup is uh, going to be faster or slower because we're on 3.1 now. I think it's bigger, so it's probably slower. But I know they tried to work on startup speed, so maybe that makes it a wash. All right, so we're going to grab the SDK 4.0.2. Downloading was fast. That's good. It has to extract it. That's going to take 20 seconds or more. And depending on if your SDK you're asking for is pre-installed, right? And if I had my own build machines, it totally would be, right? I'd install it once, and it would always be there. Um, I don't know what's pre-installed on the GitHub 
VMs. I know it's documented, I can go find out, but I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know. Right now, I want it to be the specific one, so I'm gonna just let it install it. Alright, done a restore, shouldn't take too long. I didn't have any lunch today. I'm feeling like I should probably go eat something. Come in, restore. Is it restoring the test now? Because it did this one just fine. Yeah, all right, the test took 53 seconds. What's going on with the test? That annotation thing spits out a lot of stuff. They passed. Wow. All right. I might be able to close the PR. Um, let's go over here. And let's look at this. And get out of my way, Octo Tree. All checks have passed. We are green. All right. Go with the parameter. Perfect. Squash. Confirm. Co authored by me. Yeah, I didn't really do anything. Uh, awesome. Yay. Okay. Um, at some point, I need to do a new version of this guard clause so that that actually gets deployed. Um, so right now we're on 300. <clears throat> There's a switch you can add to the test, so it doesn't restore if you've already done so. Oh yeah, dash dash no restore. I use that all the time. Uh, same with no compile, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I have that in, in here, so if I didn't, I probably should. So that was over here, it was build. Yeah, there's no restore on the build, because I do it explicitly. And then there's a do restore on the test as well. But I think it is still building, um, which I could probably get rid of. I think it's no build. Uh, dot net test no dash dash build. I don't want it to do that twice. Should not restore, yeah. Is that mine? No, all right, I think I remember opening a issue like this a long time ago. Um, but yeah, we can do a dash dash no build, I think, provided that we are building everything, which we are, because we're in the solution level. So sure, let's fix that. So we'll find out if it doesn't work in a minute. Um, now theoretically, because that issue was supposed to be fixed, if I say no build, it should also no restore. I, should, I shouldn't need both of them, um, but I'm going to keep both of them just to be safe. And you watch. Me being safe is going to result in it blowing up or something. Um, Alright, so that should kick off another build. Maybe it'll be faster. There it is. Uh, that it didn't like. Hmm. Oh, the publish. That's okay. Publish is allowed to fail. Um, that's okay. Two minutes and, you know, we're up to th almost three minutes now. Yeah, no good deed. <laughs> Um, Alright, so if I want to deploy this thing, I need to go update its csproj file, which I can do directly in visual, or not visual, in GitHub. So, we'll go in here, and this is a non-breaking change? What did we just do? This pull request was including a parameter name. That shouldn't break anything though, right? We just said... We used to throw this uh, thing here, and now we tell it the parameter name and the type. So the message is not the same. So if somebody had behavior that was tied to the message, then it would be a breaking change. Um, but as long as they don't, then this is pretty much just a point release, right? So I'm gonna, I don't think I need to make this go up to version 4.0 from 3.0 over this. So I'm going to just do it as a small change. My release notes will be modify out of range to include parameter name right there. So let's do that. So we're going to go in here. 
So our package release notes, modify, out of range, to include parameter name in invalid argument exception. All right, three dot dot one is good enough. Shady, thank you. What will be after that? Um, I'm working on Kanban fundamentals, and I'm working on DDD fundamentals with Julie. Right, you guys agree with me that you shouldn't be wrapping logic around what the message on the exception is. So that's that, that helps make me feel better. I think that's all I need. Notes and version. Um, so we'll commit that. And that should be enough to publish it. Um, and then usually I go into releases. Releases, tags. Where's releases? And I would add a 301. But does this just happen, or do I have to add it? it? Looks like one of these was manual and one of these was automatic. There's releases. Alright, I'm going to wait and see if this thing updates automatically or if I have to do it, because I honestly can't remember. Actions. The publish is going, and the publish is pretty fast. Because it's already done all the building, right? Publish, boom, blows up. Alright. That's not good. Right, I know why. Uh, let's go back here. I can update publish the same way I did the other one with the specific version because of that global JSON. So in here we said you're going to be that specific version of .NET Core, like that, and now the publish has to match. Octotree, you are really taking me off. Uh, you just need that. So let's edit this and was it 402? Yeah, 31402. Isn't Global Jason just too much fun? Oh, I know. I'm going to rip that thing out of there as soon as I commit to .NET 5. Um, Alright, so that's good to go. And that should trigger the publish again. Right there. And we should be good. And if we look at nuget.org and we search for all things our Dallas, we should see our Dallas guard clauses with its decent number of downloads. Um, none of which are recent. What did everybody download? Everybody downloaded version 124 apparently was popular for a while. Yeah, I think this is going to get less and less popular now that we have the nullable support with nullable reference types. That said, are you running Preview VS as you're apparently doing .NET 5 work now? Yes. And yes, it's Git support is better. That does... that is how nicer. Alright, so this should show my new thing here any minute now. As soon as this thing finishes. And this should work. Maybe. Why are these other ones failing? Okay, that one just hasn't finished yet. That's that. All right, everything should be green. I have absolute confidence that there's a 50-50 chance that it'll work. It's the same error. Compatible was not found. Uh, 
Yeah, I think it was, but I clicked on I clicked on one that was in progress, but then it showed me the older one. I don't know why it did that. Hmm. Alright, so no build didn't work out for me. Apparently because my build didn't build everything. Done it build. It built all the things. <clears throat> the source file. Is that why it failed? Why is this failing? VS test test return false, but does not return an error. I have to believe that's because I put in that no build thing. So that's really the only thing I've changed. Hmm. I don't know why though. I think that should have worked. And I didn't even do that on both of them, right? I did that on here, but not on publish. Everything's red. See, there's my absolute confidence uh, being shattered. Um, all right, so updating publish failed on the .NET Core build. But where's the actual publish thing right here? Is this because my key is out of date? Yeah, you're telling me you don't have a compatible version, which I thought I fixed. All right, what is publish trigger on? All right, you're 402, you're on master, uh, but only on these paths. All right, so when I update this, it doesn't change anything in there. So that's why this isn't triggering, okay. Alright, I know how to fix that. Um, let's get rid of the no build. Build, edit, get rid of that. Hopefully that fixes that. I'm not sure why it was like that. Um, and then let's just go touch something in the code, in guard clauses. Let's hit the csproj file. Let's Modify some white space to trigger a build. Um, this all looks fine. Modify include the parameter name. There we go. That's an important change. Commit. Maybe comment why no build is not there so I don't do this again next time. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. I'm not 100% certain that's the problem, so i got to wait and see if that actually is the issue. Alright, we're back to waiting for GitHub. Um, while we're doing that, anybody have any other questions? I need to wrap this up here shortly because I have some other work to get done. I should probably get some lunch. Um, so, probably got about five minutes and then we're going to see who's online and pass the torch to them. Um, but uh, this is your chance, man. Ask me anything. Ask me to come speak at your user group. Your next conference. Uh, I am scheduled to talk. I just did one today. I'm also scheduled to talk at Dev Intersection, which will be virtual, which I have workshops uh, here. And that's one of these workshops. Two of these workshops, actually. So this getting started with DDD and ASP.NET Core 3. I should probably say that's 5, since this thing's now been pushed back. It was going to be in August, and then they pushed it back to this month. And now they pushed it back again to December. So the dates on this are December 8 to 10. Uh, it's virtual. 
Um, you can sign up for, for this or that workshop. Refine those results by speaker name. Smith. Okay. That's not me. Well, that's really refined. Thanks. That's good, that's good UI. Uh, okay. Or maybe I just don't have a... Oh, they might have taken my name off of it. Because I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do it and I haven't confirmed yet. That's what it is. Yeah, so I need to confirm with them since they moved it. It was going to be in October. Now it's in December. Once I confirm with them, my name will probably show back up here. Um, but for now, it's it's not. But it was going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, I think, in this range. Um, so, yeah. Un unrefine. Unrefine. There we go. Um, it's Sunday. It's Monday. Mm, maybe it will be Sunday or Monday. Let's see if I can find... That's me right there. Right, they just don't have my name on it anymore. And that was going to be 9 to 4 on Monday. All right. And then this other one was going to be here, and it was going to be on Sunday. So there you go. Um, should be good. I've given this workshop a bunch of times, so I'll probably still do it. But we'll see. It's It's been canceled twice and moved twice already, so I'm not 100% confident it's going to happen at this point. But if it, if it doesn't, I'm sure you'd get your money back if you were signed up for it. Um, the other place to keep up with stuff I'm doing is if you go to ardellis.com slash tips, if you're not already a subscriber, um, go sign up for your email right here. I send out an email every two, every Wednesday, rather, at 10 a.m. Um, Eastern Time. I am on number 235 or something like that of every Wednesday at 10 a.m., so it's a pretty good streak. Um, I haven't missed a week yet. So, uh, unlike my podcast, where I haven't done a new episode since, like, June, um, this thing actually goes out every week, and it includes all my latest Twitch sessions, uh, links to them on YouTube, uh, all my upcoming conference talks, all my latest articles, you know, links to them, all my latest Pearl site courses, links to them. So, you know, at the, at the bottom of each one of these things, it has that info. So, um, so if any of you are, are subscribers and you like it, say so in the text in the chat um if uh if you don't like it just you know tell me why and i'll, I'll try to make it better uh what's the plan for your packages in dotnet 5 um i'm gonna try and update them to support dotnet 5 i'm expecting them to still have backward compatibility i don't know if i need to create new versions of them to do that honestly i haven't looked into it that much um but yeah they will they will quickly support it um just like i've already got clean architecture is, is supporting it. That was what we started with. Ooh, look at that. Everything built. We talked long enough to kill time. Um, it's like this watched pot thing, right? As long as we watched it, it kept failing. But now 301 is out there. So that's good. Yay. Um, all right. So what was I talking about? Um, packages. Yeah. So I, you'll probably see me working on updating things to .NET 5 on my stream because this is where I do most of that work because uh, I try and kill multiple birds with one stone. I get to do the streaming, and I get to do the uh, um, updating of the packages and the open sourcing. So that's all good. Uh, Kabazi says, when doing DDD, if we have multiple DB contexts for different aggregate routes, how do you suggest to handle database migrations? Ideally, you have different databases for different aggregate routes and different DB contexts. Um, I'm guessing you probably don't, and that's why you have a problem. Um, that's just painful. So... I would avoid that if you can. <laughs> it's, it's my best advice. Uh, Julie Lerman may have better advice, so you can certainly ask that. She's on Twitter. Um, she's usually pretty good about answering. I suspect her initial reaction is going to be, don't do that if you can avoid it. Um, if you have to do it, it just may be... Uh, I think what we have done in the past is enable migrations on one of the DB contexts, one of the projects, but not any of the others. And then you basically have one DB context that's responsible for schema, and the other DB contexts are like just for working with data, just working with your model. Um, in fact, for our original EF6 DDD fundamentals course, we, that's what we did is we had a separate project that was literally all about just managing the schema. Because we did have multiple different DB contexts and different projects all talking to the same database. So one... Uh, DB context, its only job was to do migrations and keep the schema up to date. 
you're into the realm of SQL scripts at that point, surely. Well, probably. Like, I wouldn't just commit the migration, um, but the migrations can be useful to generate the SQL. And then you then you look at the SQL, give it a sanity check, and, and then execute the SQL by hand is, is what I would do in production uh, for real applications. All right, let's go find some live coders. Live coders dev and go here and hit so, mute because they're loud. Uh, and I don't even know who some of these people are. Uh, let's go try. What is I develop things working on? I've never heard of this person. JavaScript. Uh, it's so common, so popular JavaScript. Clarkio. Oh, he's playing that game everybody's playing. I should try that sometime. Uh, Among Us, right? Let's go check out Clarkio. And let's, I haven't played Among Us yet, so we will uh, we'll try and raid him real quick. So it's been good. It's been fun, everyone. Come over and say hi in Clarkio and see how he's doing if you want. Uh, I'm going to raid him real soon now. He's playing Among Us. And uh, I'll hopefully see you next week. Thanks. Start the raid in countdown. Two, 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 two. Three, two, one. Raid.